So I'm going to start by setting up some expectations for this talk. Um, now, this talk is not going to present some sort of one size fits all method for releasing an internal project because that method simply does not exist, full stop. Every single company and every single project release is going to be different. What works for Google is not necessarily going to work for you. So this talk is going to introduce a lot of concepts here. Um, a lot of them are things that I've seen companies do wrong over the years repeatedly. Um, I've done a lot of freelancing around free and open source software strategy. Uh, I've helped a lot of companies with this and I just see people doing, making the same mistakes over and over and they, these things are preventable. We can do something about that. So I will give you a very high level summary of all of the steps that are required because it's going to be impossible to cover the specifics for every single situation unless we're sitting down having a one-on-one -on -one conversation about it. But despite everything I've just said, in the past I have given this talk and received feedback that I just didn't make it easy for people. Um, and it's, these are obviously people who just don't get it. Um, and, and that's probably my fault for not doing a good job of expressing to them that um, this isn't easy. This is never going to be easy. Um, it's also never going to be quick. I don't have a magic wand. I can't wave it and make everything better. Um, this is a complicated process. It takes a lot of thought. It takes a lot of work to do it properly. But for the folks who need a sound bite to take back to their bosses or whatever, here's the slide for you. Here's all the stuff I'm going to cover and it's also essentially the consecutive steps that you have to go through in order to release a project. Now, to get into the actual details of how you do this, I'm going to get started with something that I find is more necessary than most people would expect. And that is this question, what even is open source anyway? I'm finding that more and more often it's important to clarify this term open source right up front and that's because it, as it turns out over the past couple decades of just really impressive growth in the use and release of free and open source software projects people have lost track of the answer to this question. Um, now I am going to spend a fair bit of time about on this because it is that important. Um, you, it's kind of difficult to release open source if you don't understand what open source actually is. And now it's tea break. Hmm. So specifically, uh, what I find is that a lot of people don't realize there is a definition for what it means to be open source. It's called, surprise, the open source definition. Um, and it's maintained by a nonprofit standards and advocacy organization called the Open Source Initiative, also known as OSI. The open source definition, the OSD, is accepted around the world as the single canonical definition of open source. It's built upon the Free Software Foundation for Freedoms and the Debian Free Software Guidelines. Um, and the OSD details what is required of any software that calls itself open source. There are 10 items that are required. I know they are on the screen here, and, um, but I will be reading them now for the visually impaired. Uh, the first thing is free redistribution. Second, source code. Third, derived works. Four, integrity of the author's source code. Five, no discrimination against persons or groups. Six, no discrimination against fields of endeavor. Seven, seven, the distribution of the license. Eight, that license must not be specific to a product. Nine, that license must not restrict other software. And 10, that license must be technology neutral. Now, any software that does not provide for each and every one of these 10 items is not, literally by definition, is not open source. But why should you even care about this? Why am I spending so much time reviewing what theoretically is just basic information? Um, well, again, it is partly because most people don't understand this and they don't re realize that there is a definition at all, or, uh, but they also don't understand the importance and why they should care about this. So, Let's say that you're building a product at work, a software product, and you find this amazing software library that does exactly what you need. And using this library saves you weeks, if not months of your time. It's just brilliant. The library itself, it says it's open source and you can go to the 
the uh, whatever source forge it's using GitLab or GitHub. You can go there and you can look at the library and you can see the source code. So therefore, it must be open source, right? Well, you then learn that the maintainer of that library has a different definition of open source than you do. You are working under the OSD, which is the one that everybody uses, except some people who don't understand that the OSD exists and they make up their own definition for open source. So the maintainer of this library is using their own special delicate artisanal handcrafted definition for open source. And um, their definition means that sure, you can go ahead and use their product in their library, but if you start making money off of it, then you owe them a huge amount of money and potentially the source code for your entire product, depending on how they define open source. Um, so suddenly, because you are working under completely different definitions, rather than using the single standard definition, you ha either have to completely re-architect your product or you have to hand over your source code or you have to start shelling out a lot of your profits. You know, that's not open source though. This is somebody who isn't using the same definition of open source. And this is why it's important that we all use one definition. And the OSD helps to prevent this problem. If we all are using the same definition, this is just what standards do, right? Um, we all use the same standard. We all understand what we're getting out of this, both in technology and say in building materials. That's what standards do. They allow the interoperability that makes business happen. Now, are you going to go through each and every product or library in your software supply chain? Are you going to go through them and manually inspect them all to see whether they all adhere to the open source definition and just in minute detail, look at them to see whether they give every one of those 10 items on the OSD list. Well, no, you're not, because that would be a royal pain in the butt. Nobody wants to do that. And because nobody wants to do that, nobody would do that. And then you would be putting your company at a great deal of risk. Well, thankfully, you don't have to do that. You don't have to inspect and analyze every single open source product or project in your supply chain, because the OSI does that for you. Um, and specifically, what the OSAI does is it reviews the licenses under which software is released. To help ensure all those freedoms and benefits of the open source initiative, the OSI reviews software licenses and compares them against the open source definition. Now, only those licenses that meet each and every one of these 10 items are approved and they are called OSI approved licenses. And that's because of these licenses ensure adherence to the open source definition. And therefore only projects that use those licenses, the approved licenses are guaranteed to be open source. Others might, but you don't have that guarantee of having somebody give the oversight and review those licenses to ensure that you know exactly what you're getting. So this means you don't have to inspect or analyze anything at all. You just look at the license, make sure it is on this list, the one that's on the screen here, opensource.org slash licenses. If that license is on this list, you are good to go. And you know exactly what you're going to be getting. Now, now that you have kind of a fundamental idea of what open source is and what you're getting into, just basically. Um, now it's time for you to take the first step in releasing the project. And this is something that I find almost every single company skips over. Um, and they don't do this. And that leads to some pretty poor results. Uh, they don't figure out why they want to do this anyway. Why are they releasing this? What are the company goals? What are the business needs? Your company has this project that you have worked on internally and you've spent weeks, months, years, I don't know, but a great deal of person hours have gone into this project and you're going to release it. But what are you going to get out of that in return? A lot of people think that you can only release open source projects if it's some altruistic thing, but no, it is okay for your company to want to get something out of releasing that pro that, um, that software. What your company wants to get out of that is your, your problem, not mine, frankly, unless you hire me, in which case it very much becomes my problem. Um, so uh, there are lots of different things you could get out of it. You could get uh, better marketing, improved recruiting, um, you could cut off your, your uh, potential competitors. I mean, there's just lots of reasons to do this. Um, but if you don't know 
what you want to get out of this, you're going to go about it all wrong and you will fail completely. And you will end up with a whole lot of problems down the road that are going to be a lot more expensive to fix than just figuring things out up front. So what do you want to get out of this? The answer to this question guides your focus from here on out through the entire process. You have to have the answer. Do not underestimate the importance of the answer to this question. Not just the question. You can ask the question as many times as you want, but until you answer it, it's not going to help. So um, it will take a great deal of time for you to do this. Uh, you'll have a lot of meetings, a lot of conversations, a lot of these lovely Zoom calls that we're all having right now, but it's going to be worth it because the few hours you spend hammering this out and importantly, communicating those goals to everyone involved are really going to pay off down the line because everybody will be pulling in the same direction rather than having their own ideas about it. Um, I say here on the slide that without a goal, this entire effort will probably fail and that you won't notice. Well, that's true because if you don't have a goal, then you won't know what your target is, right? Um, and more importantly, if you don't define a goal, everyone involved in that project is going to end up with their own goal. So they'll all go in completely different directions and they will all be pulling against each other rather than pulling together. If you don't have a goal, you also don't need to know whether you're on track, whether everyone is, if they're all pulling in one direction, are they pulling in the right direction? You don't know because you don't know what direction you're actually going because you don't have a goal. You don't know what metrics are going to be meaningful. You don't know, I mean, you just don't know anything, frankly, without this goal, knowing why you are releasing this project. And again, this is the number one thing I see companies screw up when they are, um, are initially trying to release a project. They just don't know why. So please figure this out. Let's assume you have taken the time and you have figured this out and you have communicated it appropriately to the entire team. Um, what's next? Well, next you have to have a look at that project and do some maintenance, do some cleanup, make sure that everything is ready to actually be public. Um, Almost every single project is going to have some sort of time bomb hiding it there. It might be a little bitty time bomb, um, or it might be a great big massive lawsuit or a data breach sort of time bomb. You don't know until you look. Please don't assume that this is all clean. Take the time to clean everything up and actually review rather than assume. Do you have credentials in there for, say, your AWS bucket, your APIs, your, um, let's see, Say you have URLs or other uh, server names in there, things that bad hats could use to break into stuff. Please clean that up before you release it, before it gets public, because as soon as it's public, just assume it's too late and that somebody will have this vital information and then you're going to have to clean it all up internally as well as externally. So just make sure you clean it up before you release your project. Um, do you have references to any sort of trademarks in there? Is the project itself named in a way that uh, can impact the trademark of your own company? Well, that's something you will probably have to clean up before you release it. So you can have a very nice separation between these two, because otherwise you can end up with a whole world of legal hurt. Um, especially if, for instance, you are referencing trademarks of other companies and then potentially they don't like that. So they come knocking on your door with lawyers in tow and then you end up with a whole expensive issue you have to deal with. So fix all those trademarks. Um, have your team played a little fast and loose with uh, the language they use in the comments, in the documentation, in the code, with variable names, things like that. Uh, undoubtedly they have. Um, it just happens, we're all humans, things happen all the time. I, for instance, am, am prone to dropping the F-bomb all the time. So um, that's the sort of thing which I don't necessarily want to release in my project. So I need to go through and fix it. Uh, something that I'm really, really excited to see is this movement now to remove other sorts of offensive language, uh, gendered language, um, anything that shames other projects, things like whitelist, blast, blacklist, master, slave, all these problematic terms, you know, just 
recognize that they're problematic, don't argue, just remove it, switch it to something else. Language is fungible, you can find another term for master and slave, trust me. Um, Red Hat put out a really good uh, article and announcement recently that's got lots of uh, good information about this. But that's the sort of stuff you want to release before or you want to do before you release because after the fact, you might end up with a PR, um, a public relations, explosion that you need to fix and you just don't want to do that. So um, fix it beforehand. Uh, are you going to release the commit history for your project? Um, you've got all this code and your developers are committing it to source control, um, probably Git, and they write little notes, right, as they commit, make each commit to your source control. Sometimes some of those notes are not polite. Um, sometimes some of those notes include proprietary information. Sometimes it includes credentials. Um, so if you are going to release the commit history, please grab one of the many tools that can allow you to scan the commit history and try to clean that up, if at all possible. Um, it can be a royal pain in the butt to do so, but trust me, it's a lot less of a pain in the butt than having to explain to some sort of legal or law enforcement about the massive data breach you just had because you didn't clean it up. Another thing that you should be doing is looking at your entire dependency chain for that project. You are releasing this as an open source project, but because um, this is the software development world we all live in, you undoubtedly use other open source projects in there. What are they? What is that dependency chain? Are you even aware of that? Most people aren't, unfortunately. Um, but you will need to look at each piece of those uh, of that dependency chain and make sure that you are in compliance with their licenses as well. And that's because distribution, such as releasing a project, that's the trigger for a lot of free and open source software licenses. That's when it, that's when you have to start doing all the things that those licenses tell you you have to do in order to use that project. So um, before you release your project, look at those licenses and review those licenses to make sure you are in compliance with the terms of those licenses. Now, because these are licenses and because these are licensed terms, this is a le legal matter. This is intellectual property. So don't just do this on your own, assuming you know best. Please get your IP counsel involved, get your lawyers involved here because they will know better than you do. They get paid to do this you get paid to do other things. Please let your lawyers do their job. Um, don't play f fast and loose with license conditions. Just please don't. One thing you can use to make this a lot easier is a relatively new tool called Clearly Defined. You can find it at uh, clearlydefined.io because everyone's got that hip cool.io URL now. Um, so Clearly Defined is relatively new. It is a very actively developed and supported project. And it's for gathering all of this information that you need for due diligence, not just for releasing the projects that you want to release as open source, but also for the stuff you're using internally and the stuff you're building internally. So Clearly Defined is a really great tool that can help with this. Um, it's an ever-growing community-driven resource for curated license, copyright, project source code location information, for free and open source software packages. Um, it's really brilliant. I suggest you have a look at it um, and that you can build it into perhaps your uh, CICD or your other compliance tool chain to help with questions like this, to make it a lot easier upfront so you have to, don't have to do it at the back end when you're scrambling to release stuff. So let's assume you've done some due diligence and you've cleaned everything up and all the, cleaned up all the time bombs. You've got your cute little, uh, you know, bomb sniffing dogs, picking fixing things for you. Um, now, now you're ready, ready to release your project, right? Now you can just push it out there to GitLab or to GitHub and release it to the world, right? Well, you can probably assume the answer to that is going to be wrong, no. Uh, there's still a lot to do before you can release your project. Uh, it's not simply about the code. There are a lot of other things you have to think about before this, just to make sure that you have a successful project. And those things are the processes, procedures, policies, and legal requirements, i.e. the governance for your project. These are all the squishy, difficult human factors that you need to consider and that you should have in place, at least in the bare minimum. You don't have to have this massive infrastructure of, of policies and procedures, but you do at least have to consider and put in place the bare minimum. Um, one thing you should ask yourself 
is do you want a contributor license agreement? Do you want a certificate of origin or do you not? Um, now, these are things that you may not have heard of before, but they're pretty complex little legal things. Um, I will, again, read this slide for the visually impaired. A contributor license agreement, a CLA, it's a legal document intended to certify that the person sharing a contribution to your project has the right to do so. And that once the contribution is accepted, the project has a license to alter, distribute, and administer those contributions, however it sees fit. You also have a developer certificate of origin, a DCO. Now, a DCO is a confirmation by a developer that they have the right to share their contribution with the project. That developer provides their confirmation by signing their contribution using a dash S flag in the git commit, which means a DCO is git specific. Um, the DCO is intended as a paperwork free and low hassle alternative to the CLA. Now, both of these are all wrapped up in the complications of copyright. Um, and I have a whole different talk that I need to finish writing at some point, which are the basics of copyright and licensing for people because it's another one of those situations where people just don't understand even the basics and it leads to a lot of problems. Um, this is a complicated question. There are a lot of words on this slide for a very good reason because this is a difficult question to answer and it is not one that you can answer yourself. Again, this is a legal matter. This is intellectual property and copyright. For crying out loud, get your lawyer involved. Um, your lawyer is just a wonderful, wonderful, deeply skilled human being. Please don't hold them at arm's length. Bring them in and they are a vital member of your team to release this project appropriately. Now, when you're considering the question whether to have a CLA, whether to have a DCO, whether to just go with none, and that's a totally valid option, please consider it. Don't forget that there is maintenance and administrative overhead for all of this stuff. If you're gathering CLAs, you're probably going to be gathering as well personally identifiable information. That right there is a time bomb waiting to happen. You have to have a plan in place for maintaining that, for storing that, for keeping it secure. Um, DCOs, CLAs, both of them. How do you make sure that only people who have signed one of these can actually merge the code and get their contributions merged? I mean, it's just, there's a lot of overhead to both of these. That doesn't mean you shouldn't use them. It just means you have to go into it with your eyes open and know what you're getting into. This is again, where you need to be talking to specialists. One of those specialists is your legal team. So don't, don't shut them out. Don't bring them in at the very last minute, get them in the room from the very first day you are considering releasing a project. Another thing that a lot of projects tend to release without, and it's, uh, it really, hobbles them as far as their success is not having documentation. Oh, we can do that later. Oh, we all know that's never going to happen later. Don't lie to me. So for love a dog, please document your project before you release it. User docs, developer docs, installation docs, API docs, just any sort of docs that are necessary to make your end user successful. We all love using free and open source software projects that have good documentation but we also all love complaining about projects with no docs. So please, you want to be loved. You want to be in that loved column. So launch with good docs, you will be loved and you're more likely to get good adoption of your project. If that is of course something that you want to do and it's one of your goals, it might not be. I can't imagine why you would put all the effort into releasing if you don't want adoption of your project, but I've seen companies do it. Um, so what else? What else do you have to consider? Well, I don't know. Depends on your project. Depends on your, your target audience. Depends on whom you're trying to attract to your project. Will you need issue templates? Do you want style guides for your code or for your documentation? If you don't have that, I can almost guarantee someone is going to make up their own and you may or may not be happy with that. Um, what are you going to do about CICD and continuous development and tests and running your tests? How's that going to work? Are you going to run that internally? I don't recommend it. You can run it externally. Okay, well, who's going to maintain all of that? Will the project need a website? I don't know, maybe it will, maybe it won't. You almost definitely want to list it on your company's website. Well, how do you even do that? Do you know who in marketing you need to talk to to make that happen? I don't know, you should go talk to them right now if that's something you want to get listed. 
Do you need a community chat portal of some variety, be it IRC or Slack or Discord or something like that? I don't know, maybe you do. Maybe that's something you can put off until later. Only you can answer that, but you can't answer that if you don't ask it to begin with. And do you want marketing for your project? I can almost guarantee you do. Um, consider those goals that you came up with earlier on um, and keep revisiting them throughout the entire process. I don't care if you have to start every single meeting with a recitation of those goals so everybody remembers them. Just keep them front and center at all points. Now, if some of those goals include building a strong community and a strong user base for your project, and again, I can't imagine why it wouldn't, um, you're going to need some marketing for your project, full stop. Yes, marketing is vital for a successful free and open source software project, be it released from a corporate in, uh, organization or from an individual. You still need to have some sort of marketing there. And this means just like getting your lawyer involved from the very start, get your marketing team involved from the very start as well. You need to help them get up to speed about open source so they're equipped and prepared to do a really good job with what's probably for them a brand new market that they've never worked in before. And that is the open source community. So get them involved early on and that will make you more successful. This is not optional. Um, some people think it is. It is not. This is table stakes now. You need full stop a code of conduct for your project. Um, if you are building a community, then you need to establish standards of behavior for that community. When something goes wrong in your community, and it will, because we are people and people are difficult, complicated, squishy things. When something goes wrong in your community, it is difficult and unfair to hold people to unexpressed standards and expectations. That's why you need a code of conduct. Where this is the place where you can be very clear and very open about what we do here. We don't do that here, we do do this here. That's what your code of conduct is saying. And it's absolutely vital to make sure that you can hold people to a certain standard. Otherwise, again, you could be holding them to completely different standards. No, code of conduct, one standard, just like the OSD, one standard. Um, it just makes sure everyone is always on the same page at once. Now, don't forget, you, having a code of conduct is one thing, enforcing it is another completely. So um, you may or may not have the uh, skills and experience with enforcing something like this. If not, I strongly recommend that you contract with some of the very good people who are out there who do trainings around this sort of stuff. And if you want recommendations, I can give them to you after the, uh, after the talk. And I can recommend at least one re really good firm that can help with trainings around enforcing codes of conduct. So um, you're releasing this. My assumption is you want people to contribute to it for whatever reasons um, and in whatever ways. Well, if you want them to contribute, you really got to tell them how. I don't know how many projects I've seen that are released without telling people how you expect them to contribute. Um, this file is how you do it. It's the contributors file. It also is called contributor or uh, contributing. Um, so it's just contribute something. You'll, you'll figure it out. It's pretty obvious. Um, Read my book, I've got a chapter in that about it. Uh, now, this file should be as detailed as necessary for somebody to be able to pick up this file, met, is not literally because it's probably a markdown file, but pick up this file, read it, and go from zero to contribution all on their own. That would make an excellent contributor file. If somebody's able to self-service and do that. So make it as detailed as possible to allow people to do that. That could mean having pointers to other documentation. Uh, it could mean helping them set up their developer environment, how to open a bug report, how to get a patch landed, um, where are the style guides, what's the roadmap, all these things. At least have pointers to them in your contributors file to make it as easy as possible and just as seamless as possible. This is an excellent user experience sort of thing that you're looking for, where I can just make a contribution without having to bug you at all. And then I feel good about myself and I feel good about your project and I'm going to bring all my friends. And that's just really, don't underestimate the importance of a good contributors, Bob. Um, now, if you don't have one of these, then people are going to invent their own contribution methods. And I can almost guarantee you're not going to like that. It's going to take a lot more effort from your part after the fact to clean up and to try to get everyone to contribute in a way that is streamlined and makes sense. 
So just write the documentation up front and it'll make it a lot easier for everyone. So, okay, we're going to assume that you have some basic governance set for your project. It's, you've got it established, you've got thought all these things through, what's next? Now you can release your project, right? Heck no, oh my gosh, do not let that out without a license. Now, finally, it is time to choose and apply a license to your project. Because of the way we've done things in free and open source software over the past nearly 40 years, uh, that's uh, free software is about 40 years old, um, open source is 22, I believe. Um, but because of the way we've done things, everybody focuses on licenses, license licenses. Yes, they're very important and yes, they do enable free and open source software to exist at all, which itself enables innovation and all those lovely things you can get out of free and open source software. But licenses are frankly the very last thing you should be looking at before releasing your project. Do all the other stuff first and then talk about your license. Um, the license selection might be influenced by the licenses of that dependency chain I mentioned earlier. If you haven't taken the time to review your dependency chain and see whether you're in compliance with all of those licenses, you should not be selecting your own license because it might be impacted. If you haven't figured out your business goals, your business needs and your requirements, you should not be talking about what license to select because you don't know which one is going to best uh, support your goals. There are a ton of licenses. Um, every license on the OSI approved list provides each of those 10 freedoms and benefits of the open source definition, but each one also has their own pluses and minuses. There are reasons why there are so many diff different licenses, and that's because they do actually provide different things as well as those 10 uh, freedoms of the OSD. For instance, Lots of companies are very fond of the Apache 2 license, and that's because it has an express patent clause in there. And so companies think that's pretty cool. Other people prefer the GNU public license, the GPL, because they believe in sharing and the, free, uh, the four freedoms to run, study, redistrib uh, redistribute, and improve the software. Right? And that's something that your company might believe in very strongly and might be part of your goals for releasing this project. I don't know, but that sort of thing impacts the license that you select. The only way to choose the correct license is to have figured out those goals up front. What are you trying to accomplish by releasing this project? What license will help to support those goals? There are companies that think, well, our goals and our business requirements are so very unique and particular. We need an equally unique and particular license, so we're going to write our own. Oh dear, please, please. There are over 100 licenses on the OSI approved list. And while there are valid reasons for creating new licenses, yes, there are valid reasons for doing this. And there is most definitely room for experimentation, evolution and innovation in open source licensing. Yes, we need that as well. They help keep us growing as a movement, but the chances that your utility that you're releasing internally to the pub to the public, the chances that that requires that experimentation, that innovation and in licensing, it's pretty darn slim. I mean, it's it's really slim. So please look at all of your the existing licenses. Look at your business needs first before you think that you are some sort of special case because you're special in many ways, but this is not one of them. Also, until a license is reviewed and approved by OSI, it cannot officially call itself an open source license. So releasing a project under a new license, that makes it a proprietary project, not an open source project. Now, there is absolutely nothing wrong with releasing under a proprietary license if that's what your business needs. For instance, the Unity game engine is released under a license which allows people to see all of the code and to use the project. But it's in the proprietary license, so they can't uh, fork, they can't redistribute that code. And, and that works great for the Unity people, but unless you work for Unity, that's probably not going to work for you if you're releasing something. Um, so if what you're trying to do is release an open source project, you need to use an open source license. 
Don't overcomplicate things by trying to reinvent one of the many very good wheels that are on this list right here, opensource.org slash licenses. Now do work with your legal team throughout this entire process. Again, I can't say this enough. Your legal team is your best friend here, um, as well as marketing. Don't simply do what I see what so many companies do, and that is to uh, just frankly listen to what your senior developer tells you about licensing. Um, this is an intellectual property legal matter. Unless your senior dev is an intellectual property lawyer, they're unlikely to have the background or be qualified to provide legal guidance to your company. You don't probably want your lawyers writing, you know, the architecture and your code. Well, why do you want your coders giving you legal advice? There are reasons why these things are two completely separate endeavors. So please talk to your lawyers. Now, once you have your license, now you have to apply it to the code. Um, now, this is actually something that's, uh, I don't see many projects that do this correctly, and that's a problem. I do think this is something we need to clean up a lot of within the entire free and open source software ecosystem. Um, for starters, you do need a license file, or if you're using copyleft or GPL, it's called copying. And that's simply a text file of the text-only version of your license. Just put that in your repository before you release it. Make sure it is before you release it. Um, that's fine, no problem. That's quick and easy. A lot of projects do that. That's the easy way out. What they don't do is the next step. Now, putting a license in your repository assumes that somebody is going to pick up your entire repository and use it on its own, and therefore the license file will travel with it. Well, that is a case that happens pretty frequently, but what also happens a lot is that people are now free to cherry pick individual pieces of code and uh, uh, individual files from your repository. When it gets to its end destination, how are they going to tell the license on that code? How are they going to tell the copyright on that code? Well, they're not, unless you have taken the time to add a copyright notice and a license notice to each and every file in your repository. Every time I say this, people roll their eyes and like, oh, that's such a pain in the butt. And I'm sorry, Actually, no, I'm not sorry. I have no pity for you in this. This is easy stuff. This is a one line Perl script to go through and add this to every single file in your repository. These are developers. They have just crafted this beautiful piece of software that you're going to release. They know how to automate adding two lines to every single piece of code. It, don't listen to the whining. And if you need to, just add, give it to an intern. This is a really great way to them to become uh, uh, really, uh, they get to learn about the structure of your code and how it's laid out in its directories. Great, there you go. You hand it to an intern, it'll be done. Um, uh, here is an example of a, uh, a license statement. Now, this is an excessive one. It is from maven.java and it's under, a Maven is in the Apache Free Software or the Apache Software Foundation. They have these really big license statements at the top of all their code. Yours doesn't have to be this long. Yours can simply say, available under the Apache 2 license, find it at this URL. Boom, done. Um, so yours doesn't have to be this large, but this is an example of one that you can look at. So now that you've got your license chosen, your license applied, and all of the other stuff done. Now, finally, you are free to release your code. But that's frankly just the start. Once you release your project, there's, you're not going to get those benefits. You're not going to reach your goals, most likely, unless it's, your goal is simply to get it out of your face and release it and then not get any other business value out of it, which frankly would be a bad business decision, but whatever. Um, but once it's out there, you can't maximize the benefits, you can't meet your goals until you get a community. You can't, a free and open source software is a team sport. You can't do it alone. You're not going to win the game unless you build a good team. And you can't build a good team without the community. And you can't do that without trust. Trust is very difficult to, uh, to get. We've all done this a lot. We build relationships with individuals, um, but if you've ever noticed, it doesn't take much to just screw up that trust and have people walk away. Uh, so trust is difficult. Um, one thing to remember is that your community, your 
company no longer owns that project. I mean, maybe from a copyright legal perspective, it might, but it really is now a, uh, say, greatest among equals in the community. Um, you are simply a community member, simply a stakeholder, like all the other community members, and you want more and more community members, and you want to grow that as much as possible to get your benefits. Um, to do this, you have to get that trust, um, which means accepting contributions from the community, allowing them to drive the roadmap rather than keeping that roadmap all to your company, um, allow the community to drive the roadmap um, and not developing features internally and then popping them on the community and releasing them whole cloth without community having any sort of uh, input into it whatsoever. Make sure the community can actually take that project and build it on their own. You don't have all the CICD and all the secret sauce for building and releasing that project locked up behind your closed doors. Um, so these are things you have to make sure that you are doing. We discussed them earlier, right? CICD, what do you do for that? Um, it means you have to listen to them. Um, at all points, you must listen to the community. No, don't simply dictate to them. That means having open decision-making processes and leadership. You're, you have to make sure that you're not using your community simply as a low cost workforce. Lots of companies release projects saying, yay, we're going to get lots of free development. Well, no, what you're going to get is people showing up to your project, giving you a patch and then learning that they're not a part of a community. They're just giving their work for free to a company and people very rightfully so resent that and then they walk away. So you don't want to do that. You have to build the trust of making sure this is a community and not simply something that your company is driving. And whatever you do, know upfront that this is going to take time. That whole, if we release it, they will come thing, it, that's crap, that doesn't happen. This requires a lot of work to do properly. And work takes time, building trust takes time. So don't be in a rush. If your company works consistently in the open, and consistently in the best interest of the community, it will see the benefits of releasing that project and it will meet its goals, but it is not going to happen overnight. So, um, like I said, that is just an introduction to the many things you have to do in order to release uh, your project as a free and open source software project. Um, these slides are available right now here at Internet Archive. Uh, I am your presenter, VM Brasur. I'm a corporate strategist and open source leader. I also was laid off a couple of months ago. So if you want me to help your company be successful through free and open source software, you know, drop me a line. Here's my contact information, Twitter and email. Um, as Todd mentioned, I am also the author of this book. It is the one and only book about how to contribute to free and open source software. It's available at this URL, bossforge.com. Now I'm going to flip back over to Zoom and see whether there are any questions, but not comments concealed as questions. Um, and it looks like this is not going to let me do this when I'm screen sharing, so I will stop the screen share. Sorry, folks. Um, so we have some questions on Q&A um, from Troy. I'm getting a calendar notification. Troy, uh, helped open your mind. Um, Trying to pitch open source to the company and covering all these topics can be overwhelming and make the business not want to open source a project. In addition to being clear about the value a company is expecting, do I have suggestions uh, for how to start talking about the work involved with open sourcing a project in a way that doesn't scare off the business? Um, that's another talk I have. It's called the business of community, frankly. Um, and that what you have to do is understand the business perspective um, and speak their language. Um, this is... As you can see, it is a lot of work, um, but everything you do in a company is a lot of work, frankly. And how do you approach it with any other project, any other product internally? That's the same thing you have to do here. Show them the business value. It means you're gonna have to do a lot of work up front, possibly. You're gonna have to um, figure out the return on investment, the, uh, the marketing plan, all of this stuff. Come up with that up front and the more prepared you are, um, frankly, I mean, the. The more you've got your shit together, the more impressed they are and the more likely they are to say yes, but you have to speak their language. So how does your company do that? How does your company launch a new product? How does it get into the pipeline? That's what you have to do for open source. Um, answer live, I did that, done. Um, 
this is neat. I've never used the Q and A function of, of uh, Zoom before. It's actually quite useful. Um, from uh, Geneva, hi, I love Geneva. It's beautiful. I went to CERN last year. Um, happy to tell the story from the trench, but move the open source license. Okay, so if anyone has questions about something uh, releasing their own software, you can talk to Giles. Um, you also can talk to me. Um, I suspect Giles has a job. I don't. So sorry, Giles. Um, so uh, that's a comment. So I will pass on that. JRAC, uh, Justin Ratcliffe. Um, when might donating a work to a foundation make sense versus company maintaining? Ah, I was pretty sure someone was going to bring this up. Um, so this is complicated and it's an article I, I've been uh, working on in my one of my Trello boards. Um, so uh, for those of you who don't know, there are these uh, organizations that are called fiscal sponsors. And some fiscal sponsors are called foundations. Now what they do is they hold the copyright sometimes, they hold trademarks, they um, handle all the money. And they do this for typically, depending upon the services they provide, but they take about 10% of uh, the donations to a project. Um, when does it make sense to hand your company to, or your project to one of these rather than keep it yourself? Well, it depends on what you're trying to get out of it. Um, if what is vital to your goals is for that project to be seen as a standalone independent project, then yes, you need to find a good fiscal home for that. You need to find a good foundation for that. There's lots of them out there. Um, Apache, Eclipse, Software Freedom Conservancy, um, Linux Foundation is absolutely massive and holds lots of projects. Um, so that could be potentially a good home, uh, but if you don't have a massive project, it might not be a good fit. Uh, in the, U uh, the EU, you have things like OW2, um, does a really great job. So there are lots of places where you could put this. So that just adds another decision. Um, a, do you want to move it to a foundation? B, what foundation makes the right choice for your project? Um, and that's a complicated question that you'll have to, uh, that you'll have to answer for yourself. I'm happy to help you with that, uh, but you will have to hire me to do it. So let me see, uh, Jean-Georges, um, what's the most common mistake people do? Nis neglect legal. No, the most common mistake people do is not knowing why they're releasing to begin with, not having any goals. Um, and if they don't do that, then they have no targets and then they completely miss the targets because they don't have any. So that's the most common. Um, second most common is probably keeping legal and marketing out until the very, very end, if not after the fact. And that causes a great deal of problems and also really stymies any sort of potential success you're going to have from your project. So um, those are common things that I see pretty much all the time. Um, they're also, thankfully, some of the easiest to fix. You just have to know to do it up front. Um, we're running low on time, so I'm going to try and scoot through here. Um, see, Rene does not have a question. Just wanted to thank me. You're welcome. Um, uh, let me see. Um, Jose, um, uh, we are actually running short on time. So everyone, if you could, um, I will try to, if you will email me your questions, I will reply to them via email and potentially turn them into blog posts so everyone here can uh, benefit from them. I just want to make sure that Todd has time to get his stuff done. So uh, thanks for all your great questions. Uh, please email me at ato at vmbersor.com and I will try to get to them. Uh, Vicki, thank you very, very much. Um, a favor, you might have already done this. If, if I um, missed this somehow, I certainly apologize here on the front end. Would you put that email address, your contact email address over in chat? There you go. Yep, and that way, um, because I see a number of really good questions coming in. Um, and honestly, these, <laughs> I'm being totally 100% selfish here. These are questions that I, I would like to hear the answers to, too. I know I won't have an opportunity to do that, but I would like, um, you know, you to have a chance to maybe follow up uh, if you, you know, choose to do that, because the questions really are good. See everyone on this call, I, on, on this, on this um, meetup, uh, I told you this was going to be fantastic. This is a good topic. This is... Vicki, I think this is one of those overlooked, often overlooked topics that is just vital. It is so integral, foundational, and vital to open source. And I just, I don't see a lot of talks delivered on this topic. Topic. I don't see a lot of books on this topic. And it's, and it's really, it's really too bad. So you um, really do a great job. By the way, great talk. Wonderful, wonderful talk, as always. We knew what we were getting. 
we've been friends and we've worked with you for a long time. So we knew exactly what we were getting. Um, so here's, here's what we're going to do. Um, I'll go ahead and wrap up in the interest of time. I know a lot of the people joining are joining on their, you know, during lunch. So yeah, it's sort of been a lunch and learn for them. Certainly East Coast might have been breakfast and learn for those on the West Coast and even dinner and learn for those uh, in Europe and internationally uh, joining us uh, internationally. So um, thank you all for being here today. Again, re we really, really appreciate that. Um, we are going to give away five copies of Vicki's ebook. So if you want, um, if you would like a copy, if you would, uh, I'm going to ask you, I'm actually going to put our email address, drop us an email at uh, info at allthingsopen.org and let us know if you'd like a, a free copy of Vicki's ebook. Uh, the first five to respond or express interest, we'll send you a code. You can use the code to download uh, a copy of the book and uh, let us know if you'd like a hat or a shirt as well. I'm actually wearing the hat. That's actually why I'm wearing a hat today. Um, and then the All Things Open shirts, uh, we always send out and ship out a few following these meetups. So if you want a hat or a shirt, let us know at the email address, info at allthingsopen.org. And we will, uh, again, we will, we will uh, confirm the email the first few to respond. We can't, you know, send one to everybody, but we'll do as many as, as we possibly can. Vicki, great, great job. I would encourage you to follow up with Vicki, everybody on the call, um, post call today. You, you're fantastic. And um, if anybody, again, you said it, but I will re absolutely repeat it on your behalf. If anybody's looking for consulting help, um, and I know a lot of people are, or if anybody's looking to hire someone, um, my God, man, w it, it would be the best decision you ever made on both counts. Uh, because again, you've got a lot of expertise in these areas and they're just foundational in our opinion. Um, so I do want to thank our sponsors again, um, Ivan and Mattermost and also IBM. Obviously this is not an in-person event, but IBM, they always provide a space. So I know we've got a number of IBMers on the call as well. So thank, thanks to you all um, as well. Um, so our next meetup is scheduled for Tuesday, July 28th. We'll do it again in two weeks. Uh, Jean Georges, I think you're on this call. You're actually going to be delivering a talk on Spark, Apache Spark 3. And you're going to be giving us um, a 30 to 45 minute overview of Spark 3. So that's, uh, I'm interested to see how you do that. So that's the next one coming up on July 28th. I would encourage everybody on this call to join us July 28th as well. And also be on the lookout for our All Things Open announcement coming out later today. It may have just launched uh, or just came out via email. So be on the lookout via email and across social media. But the 2020 conference, um, we are making the announcement today. We're opening up registration. And there are some really big announcements related to that. So things that we've never done before. So, and you'll understand what I'm talking about once you see the announcement come, come across. But um, you can always ping us with questions. You can always reach me directly at the info at email address. Vicki, thanks again. I've got 104. So we're about right on time. Uh, we got everybody in and out in just, in just about an hour, which I think is fair. But uh, again, everyone on the call, thank you so, so much. We have people joining us from all over the world. We really appreciate it. And I would encourage you to contact Vicki uh, right after this call ends because um, she's, a, she's a superstar, an absolute superstar. That's the last thing I'll say. How about we end on that note? Thank you, Vicki, again. <laughs> thank you all. You're I, all wonderful. Thank you, Tatu. You bet. I only tell the truth. See you all soon. Take care. Hope you all have a great day and a great remainder of the week. Bye-bye.